right, so I heard that one of you um, impressed Dr. Kutzler the other day with your knowledge of where the term barbarism comes from, so good for you, whoever that was. Um, so as far as the music that <coughs> I had on being a class is concerned, right? Now, um, I told you last time, right, that this is not something that an ancient Greek audience would sit and read quietly, right? Portions of this would be performed at a banquet by uh, trained chanters, trained musicians, right? And it would be to the accompaniment, usually, of one of two instruments, right? The more common poet's accompaniment being the lyre or a kithara. Does everybody know what this instrument looks like, what a lyre is? You've probably seen one before, or a representation of one before. It kind of looks like a small four-string harp, right? Sort of like this. <coughs> right, so that's a lyre. The other is a flute known as an aulos. And an aulos is uh, sort of, it's got a reed at the top and the two prongs coming off it like that. Now, of course, a poet would not recite and play the aulos the same as someone else would play the aulos. But the reason I point you, yes? <coughs> Oh, the the satyr, yeah, yeah, or the fawn, yeah, I could use the, the right, the, the Latin term fawn, uh, Mr. Tumnus, right? He plays, what, yeah. You will often see uh, people playing these on vase paintings um, as well. Now, the other thing to note about the aulos, um, you will often in Greek texts find um, references to flute girls. Flute girls are prostitutes. Right, they would be uh, sort of invited into Greek banquets, which were entirely male, right? And they would play the flute for the men participating in the banquet, and then also do other things for them, right? So the aulos is, on the one hand, it's an instrument that's played to accompany poetry and accompany feasting, <coughs> but it was also um, symbolic of other particular things. Um, so, with that cheery beginning, um, let's uh, start talking about the <clears throat> remainder of what you were reading in the Odyssey. How'd this go for you? What'd you think? It's kind of interesting. He was overviewing most of what he did during his journey to get home. Okay, yeah. So last time, right, we just had Odysseus sort of washing up back in a recognizably civilized territory, right? And the whole stretch of books six, seven, and eight is, you know, Odysseus looking for proofs that he's back among civilized people again, right? So yeah, what we get in books nine, 10, and 11 is the details of the journey that brought him here, right? That brought him to this point. Now, there are a couple of important things we have to note as we read Odysseus's tale. Uh, for one, what reason do we have to believe any of it? What's happened to Odysseus's entire crew? <coughs> They're at the bottom of the ocean, right? He's the last survivor. No one else remains. So is there anybody who could corroborate his story? I mean, I guess you could go back to some of the islands he says he visited, right? But how likely are you to find those places? 
He can't. Pardon? <laughs> not very real. Because they're not fucking real, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he gets conveniently blown off course early in his journey, right? Doesn't really know where any of these places are supposed to be. Sort of flits around the eastern half of the Mediterranean haphazardly from island to island to island. Um, testing whether the inhabitants are friendly or hostile. But yeah, he couldn't draw a map of this journey. Conveniently, right? And when something goes wrong on the journey, whose fault is it nearly always? Is it ever Odysseus's <coughs> fault? No. Who's he blame? The people that was with him. Yeah, it's the crew's fault, right? When something goes wrong, it's always his savage, unruly crew's fault. They did something to undermine him, or they didn't follow an order, or they did something behind his back, right? And it screwed everybody over. So, in a lot of ways, the story is primed to make him look interesting, right? To make him look heroic, and to make his crew all of whom are conveniently dead, <coughs> look like a bunch of disobedient little shits, right? But we have, yeah, again, no way of corroborating Odysseus' story. And what's Odysseus' reputation? Does he have a reputation as a straightforward truth-teller? Remember again what this word meant from last time. Anybody recall? Polymetis. Many thoughts, many strategies, right? He's the wily Odysseus. He's Odysseus, his great mind teeming, right? The wheels are always turning. He's a thinker, but he's also he's a trickster and a liar, right? He's the guy who came up with the idea for the Trojan horse. All right, he's the guy who tricked Achilles into getting back in his armor and fighting, right? His reputation is as a trickster, as a liar. And so, there's no good reason for us to believe anything he has to say about his journey. So, that said, let's kind of dig into the journey itself, right? Um, what, what, part, oh, what part of this did you find the most interesting? What, what island that he landed on did you find uh, the most interesting or the most confusing? Which one do you want to talk about? I found it kind of interesting how they stayed on Cersei's Island for an entire year and their ship was still there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> pretty must be pretty well secured, right? It must yeah. be a damn good harbor. Um, but yeah, they do stay yeah. They linger certain places for a long time, right? Now, I think that there are other reasons <coughs> perhaps why they end up lingering so long on Circe's island, and it has to do with this concept we talked about last time. Can you, does anybody recall what is meant by the word oikos? Household. Household. household, yes. Ancient Greek word for household and hearth. Good. And in order to have a proper Greek oikos, what do you need? Yeah, you need a male sphere and a female sphere, right? Separate spheres. The male sphere to be the public face of the house, the female sphere to do the private business of the house, right? Good. What is Circe's island lacking before Odysseus shows up? Yeah. Are there any men 
on her island before Odysseus and his crew show up. Right, Circe and all of her servants, right, all women. It's an entirely female society. Now, the Greeks uh, were pretty horrible chauvinists. And so, to them, the idea of a female society is on its own wicked and blasphemous, right? This is a thing that should not exist. And what do we know about Circe herself specifically, about Circe's practices? What does Circe do to men who show up on her island? She turns them into animals, yeah. Now we see her turn Odysseus's men specifically into pigs, right? Odysseus's crew all become swine. But we see other signs of unnatural animal behavior here, like from the moment they land on the island. If we look at, um, let's see, where is it? It's in book 10, <coughs> page 442. Can I get somebody to read from about line 172? I was on my way back and close to the ship. Anybody can go ahead and start reading. Anytime you want. Hello? <laughs> I was on my way back and close to the ship when some blood took pity on me. Walking there alone, and then a great answer stayed standing right into my path. Mm -hmm. He was on his way down to the river from his pasture into the woods. Thirsty and hot from the sun beating down. And as he came out, I got him right on the spine, in the middle of his back. The bronze spear bored all the way through, and he fell in the river. With the groan and his spear flew away. Placing my foot on him, I drew the bronze spear out of the wound and laid it on, laid it on the ground. Okay, thank you. You can stop there. So, anything strike you as weird about the way the killing of this stag is described? And maybe nothing does strike you as weird about it, right? Because you have not done much reading of Greek epic, right? But what this models very, very closely is the way the killing of a warrior in battle is described in the Iliad, right? From the bronze spear boring through him to the groan as he falls, right? Groaning is a human sound, a human activity, and the, spear, the description of the spirit flying away, right? This is the way human warriors die in Greek epic. So what does that indicate to us about this stag? Yeah, this maybe wasn't always a stag, right? They may have just killed and eaten a transformed human being, right? Which is especially interesting given their encounters with the Cyclops and with the Lestragonians, right? They have encountered all of these man-eaters and now may have become man-eaters themselves. But the text doesn't really linger on this, <coughs> right? It's merely implied. And then when they get to Circe's doorway, how do her animals behave, the animals that she has around her house? Are they typical domestic animals? They're like dogs. Well, they're... Lions and wolves. Yeah, they're lions and wolves, but they're acting like dogs, right? Yeah. Wild animals, predators, rolling around, wagging their tails and fawning, right? Wild animals acting like domestic animals, right? This is something that should, this should tell us that something weird is afoot in Circe's home, right? And then how is it that she turns the men into swine? What does she do to them? She drugs them, yes. So Odysseus, our hero, is described using the term polymetis. Circe 
one of our temporary villains is described using the term polypharmacon. So we recognize the prefix poly, right? What does that mean? Many. Poly means many, right. OK, and do you have a guess as to what pharmacon might mean? <laughs> yeah, it's the root of our word pharmacy, right? Pharmacist. So polypharmacon means many drugs. Right? This is the term that's applied to Circe as opposed to polymetis, right? Polymetis is more or less a positive thing, right? As the Greeks regard it. Yes, Odysseus is a liar. But he's an entertaining liar. He's an, you know, he's, you know, he's a genius strategist, right? Polypharmacon is a term that is usually applied only to women. You rarely see men with this term applied to them in Greek texts. So the idea being, <coughs> pardon me, that women's cleverness is sneaky, underhanded, and dependent upon drugs, right? That intelligent women rely on drugging their victims. Remember this for when we talk about Medea next week, right? This is going to be relevant to Medea as well. OK, so we have Circe is polypharmacon, right? And how does Odysseus manage to defeat Circe? Yeah, Hermes helps him out, right? The messenger god gives him that herb that he can use to counteract Circe's drugs, right? But that's not all he has to do, right? If we look on page 445, so saying, Hermes gave me the herb, pulling it out of the ground, and showed it to me. It was black at the root with a milk-white flower, moly, the gods call it, hard for mortal men to dig up, but the gods can do anything. Hermes rose to the wooded island and up to Olympus, and I went on to Circe's house, brooding darkly on many things. I stood at the gates of the beautiful goddess's house and gave a shout. Opening the bright doors and inviting me in, I followed her inside, my heart pounding. She seated me on a beautiful chair of finely wrought silver and prepared me a drink in a golden cup. And with evil in her heart, she laced it with drugs. She gave me the cup and I drank it off, but it did not bewitch me. So she struck me with her wand and said, off to the sty with the rest of your friends. At this, I drew the sharp sword that hung by my thigh and lunged at Circe as if I meant to kill her. The goddess shrieked and running beneath my blade, grabbed my knees and said to me wailing, right? So grabbing of the knees indicates what? Submission, Submission right? I put myself in your power, right? <coughs> but we also need to note the objects associated with each character here, right? What is Circe using to try to defeat Odysseus? The wand, well, even before the wand. The cup, right? She's got the drugs in the cup. And what does Odysseus use to extract an oath from her? A sword, yes. Both of these symbols are gendered, right? The cup is what is referred to as a yonic symbol, right? A yonic symbol is a symbol that is meant to represent female genitalia, right? So typically like objects that are, you know, concave, right? The sword, right, note, where does he say the sword is? Hanging by his thigh, right? The sword is a phallic symbol, <coughs> right? So a symbol of male genitalia. And yeah, the fact that he constantly refers to it as hanging by his thigh, right? That positioning is important. That matters to the way we're supposed to interpret this. So what we have here specifically, right, is the symbol of male power overcoming a symbol of female power. And once he does this, right, 
once he pulls out the sword and threatens her, then how does she behave towards him? She like grabs all the face and Yeah. <laughs> One, please don't kill me, right? Okay, perfectly logical reaction. And then once the business of killing one another is out of the way, then how do things go between them? Sexual. Yeah, she calls him up to her bed, right? And he and his crew spend a whole year there. Right, this seems odd behavior for somebody who's desperate to go home, right? Apparently he's not that desperate to get home. But the point is, right, that each island that Odysseus lands on is in some way an alternative to the Greek civilization that he's used to, right? It's always missing something. Each of these islands is missing some essential element of civilization. <coughs> and on Circe's island, Odysseus and his men supply the thing that is missing, right? Men. There's no male side to the oikos. So they stick around here for a year and try to uh, set things in a proper Greek order, right? So let's actually sort of just go through some of these other islands Odysseus visits and we'll look at what's missing in each of them, right? So the first that he lands on is the island of the Cyclopes. And what's this place like? Green pastures and uh, untilled soil. Yeah, untilled soil, right? That's the important thing here. Yeah, that's, that's the last place he visits that is recognizably in the real world, right? So he goes, to, he goes and raids these people, the Sikones, first, right? Then he gets blown off course to the island of the Lotus Eaters, right? These people who, again, try to use drugs to keep his men from running off. But the first major adventure here is with the Cyclops. I think, yeah, as Corbin noted, yeah, he, he recognizes that the land is untilled, right? If we look on page 428, can I get somebody to read from about line 103? We sailed on our morale sinking. Yeah, Seth, go for it. We sailed on our morale sinking, and we came to the land of the Cyclops, lawless savages who leave everything up to the gods. These people neither plow nor plant, but everything grows for them unsown. Wheat, barley, and vines that bear clusters of grapes watered by rain from Zeus. They have no assemblies or laws, but live in high mountain caves, ruling their own children and wives and ignoring each other. Okay, so what does this tell us about <coughs> Cyclops society? Is there any such thing as Cyclops society? No, they're kind of anarchic, right? There is no presence here of what's called an agora. Do you guys know what an agora is? Anybody know what an agora is? Okay, so in a Greek city, the agora was the marketplace and sort of public meeting area. Right, this is why it was so important last time that the Phaeacians had a marketplace, right? And agora is one of these marks of civilization. It means that the people come together to make decisions for the common good, right? If there is no agora, then everybody just goes off into their little caves and does their own thing. Okay, can I get somebody to continue reading from a fertile island slants across the harbor's mouth?
All right, Carmen, go for it. Turtle Island slants across the harbor's mouth at a very close north bar from the Cyclops shore. It's well wooded and populated with innumerable wild goats, uninhibited by human traffic. Not even hunters go there, trampling through the woods, and roughing it on the mountainsides. The pastures, no flocks, has no tilled fields, unplowed, unsown, virgin forever, bare of men. All it does is support those bleeding goats. The Cyclops do not sail and have no crossing to build and bench red-powered ships that could supply all their wants. Crossing the sea to other cities, visiting each other as other men do, these, these same craftsmen would have made this island to a good settlement. It's not a bad place at all and will bear everything in season. Meadows lined by the seashore, lush and soft, where vines would thrive. It has level plow land with deep, rich soil that would, pro that would produce buffer crops. Season after season, the harbor's good, too. No need for moorings, anchor stones are tying up. Just beat your ship until the wind is right and you're ready to sail. At the harbor's head, a spring flows clear and bright from the caves, run by the All right, thank you, Carmen. All right, so does this island, as Odysseus is looking out at, at it, like, does it make sense to him that this place is uncivilized? He sees potential here, right? <coughs> he sees what somebody could do with this place if a smart person sort of took it in hand, right? And tried to build a civilization there. Has all the building blocks for it. Yeah, you know, we could we could grow we could grow grapes here, right? And have a vineyard. We got a great harbor, we can build ships. But no. These cyclopes don't do any of that shit, right? What do the Cyclops do? What seems to be their primary slash only economic activity? They yeah, they're sheep herders. <coughs> now, when we think back to other texts that we've looked at, when we think of, uh, say, uh, things from the, ancient, from the ancient Near East, right, like um, Genesis or like Gilgamesh, what was shepherd a conventional metaphor for? Why was Gilgamesh, for example, the shepherd of the people? What did that mean? King. King, yeah. Shepherd was a metaphor for king. The Greeks did not see things that way. To the Greeks, shepherds are barbarians, hicks. Country bumpkins. Shepherds are people who don't have the wherewithal to till fields and build cities, right? So while in Genesis, right, we saw that city building was uh, regarded as a kind of negative activity, farming was a kind of negative activity, to the Greeks, no, 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 farming is good, right? Farming, is, farming shows you're smart, farming shows you're civilized. So the fact that the Cyclops are shepherds should indicate to Odysseus that he is not among people he would consider civilized. What other activities, say, uh, mark Polyphemus in particular, the Cyclops uh, who uh, Odysseus meets, as uncivilized? Yeah, he drinks the wine that Odysseus gives him unmixed. Right? Remember that from last time, right? I you know, made you dwell on that portion in which they pour the concentrate into the bowl and then pour in water and mix it before they serve it, right? That was how civilized people, according to the Greek system, drank wine. The Cyclops doesn't do that. <coughs> he just gulps it all down and it makes him barf up little bits of people, right? So yeah, he doesn't know how to properly consume wine. What else marks him as uncivilized? How does he treat his guests? <laughs> yeah. He smashes them against the ground and then he eats them. How are you supposed to treat a guest? Yeah. <laughs> what he, I mean, why does Odysseus wait around in the cave to begin with? What does he expect? Yeah. Yeah. 
Cyclops is supposed to give, you know, the, you're visiting someone's home, right? You're putting yourself in their power. They're supposed to give you, at the very least, a meal and a, and a small gift, right? Now, maybe it's a little presumptuous of Odysseus to expect this, but according to the cultural code he lives by, right, this is what happens. This is how things are supposed to work. Your host, whether he invited you or not, is supposed to take care of you. And not take care of you by smashing you against the floor and then eating you. Now, when we look at the similar episode with the Lestragonians, what do the Lestragonians have that the Cyclopes don't? What is on their island that, the, that is not on the Cyclops island? We look on page 440. Can I get somebody to read um, from, I sent out a team, two men and a picked herald. At the bottom of the page. I sent out a team. Thanks, Sarah. Two picked men and a herald to re reconnoiter and find out who was there. They went ashore and followed a smooth road used by wagons to bring wood from the mountains <coughs> down to the city. In front of the city, they met a girl drawing water. Her father was named Antipathes, mm -hmm. and she had come down to the flowing spring Artacia, from which they carried water to the town. When my men came up to her and asked her who the people there were and who was their king, she showed them her father's high roof house. They entered the house and found his wife inside, a woman, to their horror, as huge as a mountain top. At once she called her husband, Antiphates, who meant business when he came. <laughs> he seized one of my men and made him into dinner. The other two got out of there and back to the ships, but Antiphates had raised a cry throughout the city. And when they heard it, the Lestragonians came up on all sides, thousands of them. Not like men, but like sons of earth, the giants. Okay, you can stop there. Thank you. So what false signs does Odysseus see on this island? Town. Yeah, there's a town here, right? Okay, they've got a town, <coughs> right? That's supposed to be a sign of civilization, right? That means that there should be some sort of welcome here. But the town is a trap, right? The episode here is very similar to what happens when Odysseus meets uh, Nausicaa, right, when he washes up on the Phaeacian shore, right? There's a girl there who points, his way to the, points the way to the town and says to go enter her father and mother's house, right? But in this case, they are sent to the father and mother's house to be eaten. Now, there should have been warning signs for Odysseus here as well, right? If you look a little further up, right? We sailed on from there with grief in our hearts. Because of our folly, there was no breeze to push us along, and our morale sank because the rowing was hard. We sailed on for six solid days and nights, and on the seventh we came to Lamas, the lofty city of Telepolis in the land of the Lestragonians, where a herdsman driving in his flocks at dusk caused another driving his out at dawn. A man could earn a double wage there if he never slept, one by herding cattle and another by pasturing white sheep. For night and day make one twilight there. The harbor we came to is a glorious place surrounded by sheer cliffs. Headlands jut out on either side to form a narrow mouth, and there all the others steered in their ships and moored them close in together in the bay. No wave, large or small, ever rocks a boat in that silvery calm. I alone moored my black ship outside the harbor, tying her up on the rocks that lie on the board of the land. Then I climbed to a rugged lookout point and surveyed the scene. There was no sign of plowed fields only smoke rising up from the land. So first off, what do these people seem to primarily do for a living? Shepherds, shepherds and herds, shepherds and cattle herds, right? Herds people, <coughs> barbarians. 
What's completely missing from this island? Agriculture. No agriculture, right? No tilled fields. Other sign, these people are barbarians, right? Do not stop here, Odysseus. They are going to try to eat you. This seems to be the general pattern, right? That when he runs across people who are not civilized in the Greek manner, they usually seem to try to kill him and eat him. Except for the inhabitants of Aeolia. What's weird about Aeolia? What's weird about this island? If we look at the beginning of book 10, can I get somebody to read uh, from, we came next to the island of Aeolia. Page 438. Anybody who hasn't read yet, go ahead. Look so disappointed. <laughs> Just trying to get more people involved. <laughs> All right, Kathy, go for it. Okay, you can stop there. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, so what details do we get about the lives of these people? Right, they live for one thing on a floating island, right? So conveniently, it would be virtually impossible for anyone to find it on purpose. Yeah, Seth. I have a tiny little question. So yeah. he says that he's marrying his daughter off to his boys. So are we? Am I to assume that these that these siblings are marrying each other? Yes. Okay, just yes. Just clarify that. The people of Aeolia, <laughs> clearly, or at least the royal family, who seem to be the only people here, are incestuous. Okay, cool. Which is also a non-Greek cultural practice. Right? This is something that Greeks, by and large, would have frowned on. You were not supposed to marry too close to your own family line. This was something that was fairly common um, among some of their neighboring civilizations, right? For example, um, among the Egyptians, right? The royal family wanted to keep the bloodline as pure as possible, in part because they regarded the king as divine, right? So they would frequently marry brothers to sisters, right? To make sure that everybody in the royal family shared the divine blood. Um, this also... Uh, if you look at some of the statues of some of the later pharaohs, this led to some pretty strange genetic abnormalities. Because, you know, recessive genes and all that. Um, but, yes, yeah, so they, this is one thing to note about these people, yes. What else do we think? What kind of work seems to go on on this island? None at all, yeah. There's no, these people don't do any work. And the fact that it's brothers married to sisters, and that they don't do any work, and they just spend all their time uh, feasting and making love, right? Basically, the Aeolians are, rather, are more like the Greek gods than they are like human beings. They're closer to the Greek gods in their behavior than they are to other people. Okay, and so what does Odysseus then get from Aeolus on this island? He gets that bag of wind, right? 
All of the winds that should blow, would blow him off course, right, are contained in this bag because Aeolus is keeper of the winds. Good for him. And what happens to the bag? Yeah, the crew think he's holding out on, on them, right? He gets this bag of treasure and doesn't give us any. Let's open it up and see what's in it once he falls asleep. And then, of course, they get conveniently blown right back to Aeolia. And does Aeolus feel the need to help them again? Why not? Yeah, he's not obligated to help them again by the laws of hospitality, right? He helped them once. He gave them something actually really pretty goddamn significant, right? Something that should have got them home. But because they squandered the gift, he is not obligated to give them another one, right? Just because someone keeps showing up and like, the, the law of hospitality is not like supposed to turn people into suckers, right? It's not supposed to allow people to mooch. It's supposed to ensure that people who genuinely need help get it when they need it. And maybe Odysseus does still need the help, right? But because he squandered the original gift, Aeolus is not under any obligation to give him another one. He doesn't have to help him, right? What happened, Odysseus? What evil spirit abused you? Surely we sent you off with all you needed to get home or anywhere else your heart desired. I answered them from the depths of my sorrow. My evil crew ruined me, that and stubborn sleep. But make it right, friends, for you have the power. I made my voice soft and tried to persuade them, but they were silent. And then their father said, Be gone from this island instantly. You are the most cursed of all living things. It would go against all that is right for me to help or send on his way a man so despised by the blessed gods. Be gone. You are cursed by heaven, right? If you are not cursed, Odysseus, then there is no way you should still be wandering around on the seas after I gave you that stupid bag, right? Bless you. If you are showing up back on my shore again, this is evidence that the gods hate you. <coughs> and if the gods hate you, I'm not stepping into that. Okay, so last and possibly most important in terms of general course content episode that we were looking at for today. Um, what did you make of the journey to Hades that Odysseus undertakes? Is there anything that struck you as interesting or weird about this? When he visits the spirits in the underworld. He sees all the old heroes. Yeah, he just happens to see all the old heroes, right? Now, what prompts him to mention that he's seen all the old heroes? Does he volunteer this information on his own? So he stops talking about his journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the fighting king's name, but he urges him to keep good talking. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Odysseus pauses, and Alcinous says to him, right, on page 460, Odysseus, we do not take you for the sort of liar and cheat the dark earth breeds among men everywhere, telling tall tales no man could ever test for himself, almost as though he knows Odysseus is bullshitting him, right? Your words of outward grace and wisdom within, and you have told your tale with the skill of a bard, right? You have told your tale so well, it doesn't matter if it's true, right? It's been so entertaining, we don't care if you're telling us the truth. All of the Greeks and you yourself have suffered, but tell me this as accurately as you can. Did you see any of your godlike comrades who went with you to Troy and met their fate there? The night is young and magical. It is not yet time to sleep in the hall. Tell me these wonders. Sit in our hall and tell us of your woes for as long as you can bear. I could listen until dawn. 
Right, so Al um, Alcinous is specifically asked Odysseus to tell him if he saw any of the heroes from Troy, right? And conveniently, what does Odysseus then, who does Odysseus then conjure up? Agamemnon. Yes. First, the general Agamemnon, right? Who tells the tale of his murder at the hands of his wife. And which other heroes of Troy? Achilles. Yeah, Achilles. And Ajax, who refuses to speak to him. But Agamemnon and Achilles both speak to him at length, right? <clears throat> what do their speeches have in common? Who do they both want to know about? Their sons? Yeah. They talk about their own woes, right? But both of them end their little speech with like, but can you tell me about my son, right? Where is my son? I know he's not dead, he's not down here yet. Can you tell me where he is and what he's doing? Why are they so concerned about their son specifically? I can remember that had daughters too. That's who carries his name. That's exactly the issue. It's the son is the carrier of the family legacy, right? If we look at Achilles speech in particular right page 463 can I get somebody to read Odysseus's speech starting with Achilles by far the mightiest of the Achaeans Odysseus's address to Achilles Okay, great. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, so Achilles, great Achilles, right? You are the greatest of warriors in life, right? You must be a king down here in the underworld. Things must be great for you. You must be lording it over everybody. And I spoke, and he answered me at once. Go ahead, Seth. I know you want to. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> um, Don't try to sell me on death. <laughs> Don't try to sell me on death. Oh, okay. Don't try to sell me on death, Odysseus. I'd rather be a hired hand back up on Earth, slaving away for some poor <laughs> dirt farmer. Then lord it over all these withered dead. But tell me about that boy of mine. Did, did he come? Did he? Did, excuse me. Did he come to the war and take his place as one of the best, or did he stay away? And what about Peleus? What have you heard? Is he still respected among the Myrmidons? Or did they dishonor him in, oh, high word. <laughs> Phythia. Phythia, okay. In Phythia and Hellas, crippled by old age in hand and foot. And I'm not there for, and I'm not there for him up in the sunlight with the strength I had in wise Troy once when I killed Ilion's best and saved an ar the army. Just let, just let me come with that kind of strength to my father's house, even for an hour, and wrap my hands around his enemy's throats. <coughs> they, would, they would learn what it means to face my temper. All right, thank you. So he's thinking about his son and also his own duty as a son to his father, right? Which he can't fulfill now that he's dead. But what's his general attitude here towards death, right? Is he a lord among these shades? No, and this is the thing to remember about ancient world afterlife concepts generally. Like, death sucks, right? Death is lame. There is no reward in the afterlife, right? You're finished. 
you no longer have any relevance in the world above, right? All you do is flit around underground. Yeah, Kathy. So, like, did the Greeks not believe in heaven or something? No, that, yeah, everybody goes to the same place. So, that's actually another thing to note about ancient, like, <coughs> ancient world, um, underworld concepts. Right? The underworld is literally a place under the earth, right? It is a place that you can, in most ancient belief systems, conceivably visit. You wouldn't want to, because it is both, you know, alternately scary and boring, right? But it is considered a place like on the physical map of the planet, right? You know, um, Circe actually gives um, Odysseus specific coordinates for reaching it. Now, the places she tells him to go to are mythical, right? They don't exist, but it was believed that the underworld was actually a place inside the earth that you could conceivably access through like particular caves. So, yeah, so death sucks, right? Death is horrible. Death is like, death renders you completely irrelevant, completely powerless. <coughs> so this is why they're so focused on their sons, right? Because that's what they still have left up in the world above. If they have a son to honor the family name and carry on the family legacy, <coughs> then that means that they still matter in some sense, right? Their blood is still up there. Now, are these shades usually able to communicate? You're shaking your head. What, 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 what is required in order for the shades to be able to talk? They have to drink the blood of the sacrifice? Yeah. Does anybody remember uh, the word we used last time for this kind of sacrifice? If you're trying to talk to the gods in the earth rather than the gods in the sky. Chthonic, yes. You have to make a chthonic sacrifice. Right, so what Odysseus has to do here, right, is he has to pour out, he has to dig a pit, pour out some drops of wine into it, and then kill those two sheep and drain the blood into the pit, right? And then what is it that will bring the sh that will give the shades the semblance of life? They have, to drink of it. they have to drink the blood, right? So if they consume right, the substance of life, then they can temporarily rejoin the living, right? They can temporarily speak to the living. Otherwise, right, if they don't have access to the blood, they have no memory. They don't even remember their lives in the upper world. It's the blood that brings it back to them. So one last thing. We're running a little short on time. There's one last thing that I want to note here. Again, mostly like what we're doing with the stuff in the Odyssey, right? Why I've chosen these particular sets of books is because um, it gives us um, a little bit of a crash course in ancient Greek values and in ancient Greek culture that's going to help us understand some of the other Greek texts that we're looking at that are a little bit more complex um, in the coming weeks. So I want to look at the prophecy that Tiresias the seer speaks to Odysseus starting on page 453. Can I get somebody to read from the flawless seer rose and said to me? Bottom of page 453. Who feels like a flawless seer today? All right, go for it. Thank you, Tatiana. You see the home from the sea is hanging. Shine in Odysseus, for that God will make you bitter. For I do not think you will elude the earth shaker who has laid a route in his heart against you. Curious because you find a pain. See, you just might get home. You have to pain. You and your maid, if you 
curb your own spirit and there's to when you beat your shield on your knees. You will be marooned on that island and the Bible see and find there the cattle of Kelius, the son, and his sheep too crazy. Leave these unharmed, keep your mind on your own journey, and you will still reach the people. Do not without pain, do not without pain. But if you hold them, I foretell them for you, your ship and your group, and even if you yourself escape, you will come home late and badly having lost all companion. And then another ship. Okay, you can stop there. Thank you. Um, so, do you notice anything about the language Teresius uses that may be a little unusual for someone who's supposed to be able to predict the future? He said it might, may. Yeah, everything is a might or a may or an if, right? He, te he tends to speak in conditional statements. Right? If you do this then this will happen. If you do this other thing, then this will happen. If you do this third thing, something else will happen, right? This is the way Greek prophecy is often phrased, right? Because what do we remember from our discussion of fate last time? How does the Greek idea of fate work? It's going to happen regardless. You can't do anything about it. Yeah, the end point is set, right? The end point is set from the time you're born. But does that mean that there's only one particular way for you to get to that end point? Somehow, you will get there. You, you know, but the choices you make will affect how you get there, right? The choices that you make, the things that you do, will <coughs> affect the state you're in when you reach that final endpoint, right? So if you don't kill the cattle of the sun, right? If you just behave yourself, keep your men in line, then, you know, you'll get home, all will be well and good and safe, right? If, however, you disregard these warnings, then you will come home alone, naked and dirty, in somebody else's ship, right? So we already know from this, what choices Odysseus is going to make, right? Or what choices he's going to blame his men for making. Not the good ones. But yeah, so bear this in mind as well uh, when we're reading other Greek texts that involve faith and prophecy, right? This is kind of how it works. There are going to be a lot of these kind of conditional statements. All right, uh, so we're about out of time. Does anybody have any questions? Take your silence to me now. Okay, so I'll oh, go ahead. You think he tells this elaborate tale just for his story? I mean, he's got these people eating out of the palm of his hand, right? They don't care if it's true or not. They just want him to keep talking. So yeah, I mean, who who doesn't like to keep talking before a rapt audience, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I was guess, oh right, to remember. Um, I just want one thing I want you guys to remember. Uh, the response paper two is due on Friday, right? So, um, Georgia View is shutting down for a few hours at 10 p.m. So try to get it in by 10 p.m. rather than uh, by midnight, okay? Uh, so that you can act, so that there will be no problems uploading it. All right. So that's all I have for you. Um, I'll email you reading questions from Medea because for whatever reason they're not on my flash drive. Um, see you, we'll see you on Monday.